Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Squawk 876 where we bring you the lives of aviation professionals and today I have with me the Captain Maria Zaidi Haddad, that's correct. Okay, <laughs> so I won't even go through the length of introduction, I will actually let that flow in itself in the interview, so I'll just tell her good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Antonio, and thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning. So we'll just get straight into it. So I'm going to ask you, what was your life like growing up? What was young Maria like? Well, I, I would say I was a tomboy, very adventuresome. <laughs> um, I liked being outside a lot, and I had pets. We had dogs, and we would... Uh, always be going to the beach in Montego Bay. I, I was born and I grew up in Montego Bay. Always okay. beach, very casual lifestyle. You know, friends running around. In those days, you never had internet <laughs> or any of this electronic <laughs> stuff. I, I remember when I was, uh, what, seven, eight, we even had TV on the island. So oh. in the 50s, it was quite different. You had to sort of improvise and, and find play other your own ways games. To and of course, I like dolls and I like my pets, but I also like to climb trees and... You so you, you had a balanced life, yeah. you know, you had your dolls, but then at the same time, you know, yes. Yes. you had dirt on yes. you sometimes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So did that kind of life, it would, uh, I'm sure that, you know, what a child would do when they were younger, it would influence what they would want to do when they're older. Yes. So what was school like for you? What did you think that, you know, and this is what I really want to do with my life. This is what I'm interested in. Did your background influence that for you? Uh, not, not really. Well, not for aviation. I was not um, socialized to be a pilot or do anything non-traditional. I was more told, you know, get a good education, finish your education, which I did at high school and a few years of college. Um, I remember at school being shown by the teachers the role of, say, a stewardess at the time, which is a flight attendant, teacher, nurse. I don't remember being shown a doctor or a lawyer much as a pilot. So I was geared up for the traditional female roles. And I don't remember any of my family members being in aviation. As far as I know, nobody ever was, and no one promoted that to me. So eventually, I thought I would go into medicine and that I would be a doctor or a vet. That's really what I thought I would do. It wasn't until way later that I thought of aviation. So, as you mentioned, you know, you were going through that process, get gearing up yourself to go into medicine. Mm -hmm. So, aviation, medicine, it's a, it's a jump, you know, so, yeah. so what made you make that jump? What brought you to the point where you decided, you know, I think that this is what I really want to do. Well, I was always fascinated by flying because we would fly between Montego Bay and, um, Tinson Pen or Manly. And I had done a, a flight with Ken Rutter. I may have been around four or five. That was fascinating. So it wasn't until I was with Air Jamaica at say 18, I think it was 18, 19 when I was a flight attendant that I realized I was interested in doing it as a hobby. So I originally started as a hobby because there were no women flying commercially in Jamaica with the airlines, domestic or international. Yes, there was Mrs. Barnett, she was an instructor here, and we had a number of women here who were private pilots. So it wasn't until I actually started the private pilot training, and about a year into it when I was um, encouraged to go on as a commercial pilot and think of instructing that I thought, okay, this could be a career, and I had the ability, and I really liked it. And, and I was in the right place at the right time. So I wanted to go back a little into high school life. Which high school mm -hmm. did you attend? And what did you like in school? The high school I attended, which is closed now, Servite Convent, and they were in Brownstown. Okay. And it was a boarding school. Um, I really enjoyed biology. That was my first love. So that also fed my desire for medicine. And I did fairly okay in chemistry. Didn't care for physics much. <laughs> it wasn't until later on when I was in the aviation that I, and aerodynamics that I grew to like and understand certain things. But physics as a whole, no. But anyway, biology, maths I did very well in, and geography. Languages, I, I didn't care for English language or literature, but we had to do it. As you know, to get a good job, you need, well, at the time it was six GCE O levels. You okay. had to have math and English. 
and I ended up with seven. So I was, uh, you know, educated for where I wanted to go on to. But it was those subjects, and I liked school because, um, you know, you, you had friends there, and some of the teachers I, I liked. I also really liked my biology teacher, Mrs. Howard, so that helped. It helps when you like your teacher or your instructor, and you tend to be more motivated. Okay, so I'm aware that you did not go straight into flying, mm -hmm. but you became an air hostess. Yes. So what was that like? And then what pushed you into the true transition into being a pilot? Well, as a flight attendant or a stewardess or a hostess back in the day, it, it was great. It, was, it started like as a summer job for me, and I didn't intend to be there three and a half years. But it was great because it gave me the base for earning an income, which I saved. I saved most of it. I didn't have a husband, children, any dependents. I didn't have any real bills because I lived with my family. That's another thing. Living with the family, saving and not splurging helped me to go ahead with my, my career. So being a flight attendant helped. I was around the airplanes and the cockpit and pilots. I had good mentoring and encouragement. Went, went to, on the routes that I would eventually fly as a pilot. Um, so that helped me obtain my, my loans, continue right up to the commercial level and come back and pay off those loans and then continue on. Because, you know, everyone's life is impacted by finances yes. one way or another. Yes. Yes. So it would, uh, would be right of me to ignore that aspect. No, that, that, that's a, a good <laughs> concern. So. I had to go through the Student Loan Bureau and that, that was challenging to get the loan. I eventually I, I received that loan and I did, it, did the flying for six months. So at Opelaco, the time you were able to acquire a student loan from the Student Loan Bureau here. To fly? To fly, at the time. Okay. And I don't think it's possible anymore. It, it that, isn't. That is a problem. I, and I don't know if anybody would like to go to a bank and even get a loan here. It, it's a tremendous amount of risk. But um, having worked, I was able to pay that off. So having received that, that helped give me a big, a big jump start. You know, because good. I had to go away to do the, the instrument okay. rating. All right, so seeing as, seeing as you started your training in Jamaica, what was that like being trained here back in the day? It was wonderful. I, I, I think I had very good, capable instructors. It was pleasant. I was up the road here at Wings, Jamaica with Mr. Barnett, and uh, I enjoyed flying around the area and the island for whatever. I thought I, it was good, it was wonderful. And even when I came back from Florida, I had to convert to the CAD requirements. I still would come out and fly maybe once a month because I was a second officer. And even as a first officer, I continued to do that till I, I, I upgraded. Right. All, and I would love to go back out now. <laughs> so um, my next question is, you mentioned that you had to go overseas to complete your training. So if you could compare for me, what was it like being trained in Jamaica versus being trained overseas? Well, um, first of all, the visual is different. You know, you have terrain. Mm -hmm. that, that is um, a serious consideration, terrain. You don't go flying into a... Uh, the side of a hill or a mountain. My father um, would tell me that the highest thing that America has over there or Florida has is a light post. <laughs> Probably they have a few buildings a little higher. But yes, it would be, I think, terrain in, in where I was, terrain. But uh, over there, the airport and the airspace, it's dense. And ATC communications are quite different. So you have to get used to the ATC communications there. Um, I think it was a, that was a t two big considerations and uh, three, I had help with family for housing and transportation to and from the airport somewhat, so that helped. Okay. You know. So in terms of, you know, the training itself when you were overseas? I, I liked the school that I was um, part of there, the one, part 141 school, very structured. Uh, we didn't have internet, but they had the CBTs, and I thought I thought the program they it was a Cessna school, okay, and it was uh, very structured in what they offered. Okay, all right. So challenges. I'm sure that you know it's it's school, so mm -hmm. you know there must have been some sort of challenge somewhere. Oh yeah. So what were the challenges like in flight school, or what challenges did you face in flight school? 
Well, wherever you go, it's getting accustomed to your location. Some people may have a hard time with transportation getting to and from, that's the first thing. Um, you may have challenges with availability of equipment, of aircraft, an instructor, or a sim, or a study room. So scheduling and availability can be an issue if you're not um, forward thinking to plan things ahead. Okay. Um, there's that. There's If you go overseas, there's a culture if you're not used to being away uh, from home. That's, that's another thing. And then studying. Uh, do you know how to study? Do you know how to be effective in studying? Do you know what to study? You know, and um, some people, I usually revert to flashcards, electronic or handwritten flashcards, or, or, or creating your own notes or your own diagrams, even now today, because I'll be going back into teaching. Okay. So you have to keep certain things that your brain can understand. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Because you're not going to get, I, I, I don't get everything. I, don't, I can't remember everything, I don't understand everything, so you have to work on it. So while you're studying to the concept of, of you know, the forces on flight or, or the carburetor or whatever, you might have to vocalize, read it, and talk to yourself. This is, this is what it's all about, so you understand. Pretend that you're teaching it. So you it's know. like, you know, it would be really good for someone or a student to learn your learning style know what works best for you correct and keep at it correct there, there are several learning styles and teaching styles um, so if you can understand how you learn best are you visual are you audiovisual you know do, do you have to draw it on a blackboard or a whiteboard or whatever you know what is, do you have to say something into a, um, a audio device and, and listen to it at night maybe under your pillow when you're sleeping Mm -hmm. Because I know when I first joined Air Jamaica as a second officer, that was taught to me by, by my teacher, my engineer at the time. He said, back then it was a little cassette recorder, speak out the, the flow or what you're doing for your ram check and so on in detail and then listen back to it while you're watching. So there are different ways of, of learning something. Okay, so let me ask, you plan to go back into teaching. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would that be at your old school or...? Where, have you been back to your No, high my, 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 uh, funny enough, wherever I've been, they've all closed. My schools have closed. Um, the two former airlines at Air Jamaica are closed as we know it, right? <laughs> so I don't have anything, and even the flying school in Florida has closed. Oh That's really odd. It's like wherever I've been has closed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, so I would, I would, um, Probably, I've been teaching on the side, the ATP, CTP in Florida. So I would go to a part 142 school and probably start teaching that in January. Okay. And I'd probably go back into general aviation, do a flight review. So I'd be going back into the books, you know, how to uh, pre-flight a Cessna 172, <laughs> you know, what height do you flare at, Those things like that. Things. Do a little walk around on that, what do you need to do? Of course, you forget that over over years so you have to have the same discipline as you would when you're starting out all right so many persons don't know air jamaica many persons don't know what it was like what the lovebird was like so i'd want you to bring back that idea for me what was what was a lovebird well air jamaica as we know it started to ramp up between 1966 and 68 until it closed somewhere between 2010 and 2011. And uh, there was the original Air Jamaica 1968 and then there was the next one on the Air Jamaica Holdings in, I think it was 1995. And they started off, I think, from here to Miami and New York with DC-9s and then DC-8s and then they acquired the 727s, the Airbuses. And they continued to grow throughout the decades. They were an awesome national flag carrier. They had great standards. Air Canada and Air Canada pilots had a lot to do with the training, particularly in flight operations. Came J Jamaicanized, I believe it was in the 1980s. But the initial cadre of Jamaican pilots were starting ground school January 1971. And the standards were very high. I enjoyed, I was there for 31 years, enjoyed it tremendously, did very well. Thank God for Air Jamaica, I was able to jumpstart my aviation career. Because I always hear, or I've always been told that the quality of pilots that are 
coming from Air Jamaica. Mm -hmm. They go anywhere, they are the best in the world. We, mm -hmm. we have the, the best rate overall. The, that is something that is unforgettable. You can't replace yes. that. That is something yes. like you, you hold on to, something like that. Yes. So you knowing the quality that Air Jamaica has, right, and you going into this airline, the, the interview process, how did you feel? What was, what was that like knowing that you're going to be going up to become one of the best? Well, just being selected for an interview was awesome. It was an <laughs> awesome opportunity. As a matter of fact, some of us were in the interview and we flew from here, from work, to go and get the manuals and stuff. But when we went for the interview, uh, in the day, for my interview at least, it was about a five or six person panel with various managers um, within the organization. And like most interviews, it's to verify what's on your application and in your logbook and verify that you say who you are, you know, and are you a presentable person, are you groomed, can you speak, can you convey what you need to convey. And then of course there are the situational awareness, human factors, questions like the what ifs. What if you did, if you did a walk around, you saw something not right, or what if you ran into a problem, you know, who do you go to? It was a lot of what ifs and situational awareness. And of course there may have been one or two technical questions, and that has been throughout the career. Uh, the last interviews I did for Atlas Air, it was a four-part interview, and one of them was to actually write an essay within a time period. Yes, an essay. <laughs> so I had to go back to the basics of essay writing, and that was fine. Um, and again, the logbook and what you're saying, and the technical was there. We did a technical online interview, which they've stopped now. And then at some point in the interview, someone asked you to brief an approach. I had to brief the Alice approach for runway 31 left in Kennedy, which I, I did all the time. So that was my Air Jamaica training coming out naturally. You know, this is what I would Helping do. Helping you and just. And the Air Jamaica training came through when I was with that carrier. It was always a high standard. I mean, I don't think anybody thought my standards were anything else but high. Always that professionalism, even though some of the flying was cargo flying or night flying and no passengers, we, we, we still have to put out our best all the time. All right, and uh, knowing your career, what you have done over the years, it wouldn't have taken nothing short of God and uh, mm -hmm. some serious determination pushing because I know that there would have been some days where you were mm -hmm. tired, mm -hmm. it was a lot to manage and you still pushed through to where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here we are, and I'm asking you questions. Mm -hmm. So for young persons who are watching, who would love to be in your shoes, what, could, what would you tell them that it takes to be in your shoes? Well, uh, everybody has their own path to begin with. You know, I, I wouldn't wish anybody to be in my shoes because there is the good, the bad, the ups, the downs. So everybody has to, to walk their own path. But to have a, a sample of this life where you have had success, I believe um, you have to be in the right place at the right time. You have to be prepared. What are some of the things you can do? Education, finish your education, uh, prepare for interviews, You know, whether it's going online or YouTube or sitting down and, and, and asking someone else, what was your interview like? Things like, um, studying with other people, having a study buddy, having a mentor to study with, be accountable to is very important. Um, oh, may I ask, did, do you, did you have any mentors that pushed yes, you? Yes, and I still do. You have different types of mentors. So to me, a mentor is someone you can look up to or say, that's what I'd like to or that's what I'd like to be. So I still have mentors who, some are dead. In other words, the, the, the Mr. and Mrs. Barnett that started, you know, I learned from her path, I was able to step into her shoes because I was able to show to people, look, this is who you had in Jamaica teaching for 40 years or 20 years. That's how I got that loan. Um, many of my mentors were other female airline pilots who I eventually met, and they were in the newspapers. Uh, when I've gone to the various companies, mentors are people who, are give, who have given me encouragement or who have watched and learned from. Sitting back as a second officer, 
you can sit back and watch other people flying. And when they give you advice, it could be a criticism, you learn from them. Right now, um, my mentor would be say, whatever instructor I decide to hire to go back into general aviation, you know, or whatever courses I'm going to do to go back into a certain level of teaching. So yes, you have your mentors. And then you have, you have mentors who are outside of aviation. Could be your, your, your church people or whatever group you're in or, 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 or club, you know, your club right here, your mentors. So you want to look for the positive and the good around you. And you mentioned God, I, you know, I believe in a God and I believe um, God gave me abilities. You have to be very honest with yourself. Do you have the ability to do this and go forward with it? And that's that was one of my prayers, you know. God, if this is meant to be, you've given me the gift, you know, I will use it. You know, I don't think it just came out from thin air. I don't think I created this. I believe I'm creating it, yes, with myself, but the divine, you know, with God. So, and we have to give thanks for the good and the bad, what we're learning from and what we're expressing and, and doing more with. Because, you know, God wouldn't put you in a position that he didn't think that right. you could handle, you right. could do. And, and here it is, uh, part of that journey is for me to mentor and give back. I've been asked to do interviews and career day talks, so you can't think that you're too good to not reach out to other people and speak to them and help them if they ask. You know, and one of the things you also want to tell them is, do you have the ability? Do you have the capabilities to do this? And I, I don't preach going out for the money. I'm sure you've heard me say that. It's what you love and your passion. I've seen people who have gone out for the money, something happens and they end up with nothing. Especially in this COVID time, people leave for a better job or think it's gonna be great. Things happen, 9-11 happen. So sometimes you really have to sit down and discern where are you really meant to be and follow that hunch. Should you be staying where you are or should you step out? You have to be um, you know, careful about discernment about where you need to be next and it's always the right time at the right place mm -hmm. and yes i've made mistakes you know i, mean, I don't know if i was being. meant to be here or there but wherever i went to i made the best out of it all right you know because we had choices i could have gone to the middle east or china or wherever my husband and i because he flies too we didn't we chose to go a path it was rough at first we all had to start all over again as very junior first officers under another captain. <laughs> yeah, bite your lip and put on the band-aids, you know. So, and it worked out good, you know, because you make the best out of it. All right, so, Fat, you mentioned that it, it, it leads me to ask you, being a first officer, what was it like? Because, you know, you mentioned mentors, which could be yes. persons who are right beside you, persons who are a little bit higher than you, it yes. could be anybody. Yes. So. And you, you'd normally, as you mentioned, positive mentors, persons yes. who pushed you in a good way and they molded yes. you as best yes. as possible. So what was it like being a first officer? What was your captain mentor, like the person who you'd work with? I found um, back in the day before this CRM and TM and all these phrases, uh, crew resource management and so on, um, we had some real dinosaurs, but we had a few uh, gentlemen there and they were really great at briefings or speaking with you or showing you a certain way. Or, and um, it was always a pleasure to work with those people. Those that were, <laughs> were not um, either polite or a bit rough or whatever, you found it would bring out the worst in anybody. I mean, got me faced the same way. <laughs> there are certain things I will not take. So, expected, I mean, you know, and there are times I will not be pleasant, I will say something too. I mean, right? you're so. it, is a, it is clear that okay, back in the day when you were flying, it was a male dominated field, no questions yes. asked. So, when you see a female come into your space, you would think that the first thing you wouldn't do is to try and discourage them, which is the case in out of person situations where they're discouraged because of where they are and what is what's the, the norm there and them being the first or one of the first persons in that position so you would think it would be a more welcoming situation and that's not yeah. always the case 
No, and, and, and life isn't, you're not going to have a red carpet everywhere you go, regardless of who you are. So whether a male or a female, when I was starting out, you will find different personalities out there, not just because I was a female. But there were some, I think, who went beyond and above the call of duty, who really went out of their way to, to give a lending hand, you know. So it, it, sh it certainly helped. All right. And if you are doing your job and your work, and you are passing your exams and you're doing well, there's very little anybody can say after that. They may not still like you. Everybody's not going to like you. You're not going to like everybody. And even recently, I was with an American company. You still had people with their differences. You know, so you have to work through those waters. Everybody's not going to like you. But if you're a professional, do what the company says you're supposed to do. They can't, they can't fault you for, for doing your work. True. If you're not doing your work, That's there, different. Are, there are ways of dealing with you. True. So for anybody out there, male, female, whoever, know your work, do your work, and be conscientious at your work, and diligent, and disciplined. And the, the jobs that I've done in aviation required you to be on time, punctual. Are you going to be on time and punctual? Nothing worse than have people coming for a flight late. You know, I've seen that. People come late, don't care attitude. Well, that's, that, that's not good. So you have to be diligent and, 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 and being that persona that they're looking for. You know, wearing your uniform with respect. And it starts from knowing the club or wherever you're going to work or school. You know, whatever you're doing. It translates to your work and your life and eventually your profession. Because I learned that, you know, as a young child between the age of, say, one and five, mm -hmm. that's when you're like a sponge. You, you mm -hmm. soak up mm -hmm. everything that you mm -hmm. see and, you know, throughout your younger life, adolescence life, whatever you learn in those years, mm -hmm. you carry it with you throughout mm -hmm. your life. So if you yeah. learned bad habits, if mm -hmm. you didn't practice certain things when you were younger, it would be hard for you to expect yourself to magically do the right thing when you're older or because Correct. you're going into an environment where you're expected to do the right thing. So, so yes, the formative years, yes. But, so we don't discourage um, folks. Um, this is why I'm having a mentor or a counselor or a teacher that tells you things is helpful because you may not be that person but as you go through life your teachers or your school prefect or whichever leader you have will say hey so and so and so and if you're open enough as a sponge later on in life you will learn and you can change habits so even though you don't learn it in your formative years yes the formative years are very very helpful um, later on if you are open if you to learn to learn exactly you have to be self-motivated you have to have the esteem you have to believe you're worthy of it and you have to be quite open and strong and honest to have someone explain to you or help you. And that person could be somebody of a different gender, religion, race um, or age, could be somebody younger. And that's another thing, you know, um, you can come into some of these work environments that I've been through when I went into the second job uh, in the U.S you may have someone who's superior to you who is much younger and vice versa. When I went into the left seat there, I also had people who were at times more experienced than me because other airlines had closed. Okay. And these very senior people came in. So you, this is where professionalism and standards and briefings help and just being, you know, calm. All right. So I'm going to also ask you, you know, your many years of the career that you have. I'm going to ask you the best experience, the worst experience, <laughs> and the weirdest experience. So I want to go with the first one. But what is your best experience oh. as a pilot? Well, there, there are so many, so I would chisel it down to basically one when I got into the airline actually both airlines, Air Jamaica and Atlas, getting into. And then the second best in them would be when you're upgraded to say a captain, because that was always my ultimate. That was my dream to go there. And it was possible at both. I never thought it'd be possible. The second time around, I started at 55. And at that time, they were not upgrading 
within 10 years. I never thought I'd be a captain on a 747. And life was good, good to me, so yes, those were my very best experiences. Uh, I had many. Um, the most challenging or the more difficult would be, of course, in those same positions when you're starting out, is to feeling comfortable there, attaining whatever, and being accepted in those positions too. Um, the worst would be, of course, working or being with people who didn't accept you or didn't like you and just being plain all off the cuff, you know? Mm -hmm. There are those. And of course, if you had an emergency, I had um, one or two at both airlines. Okay, so what those are not what you want or you wish for. Um, what they have been. Uh, Air Jamaica, really as a captain, because I had a second officer, first officer, but I'm, I'm not the pilot in command, but as a captain, with Air Jamaica, it was a loss of a hydraulic system. Okay. Full aircraft, A321, and returning to land in Miami. It was runway, I think it was 27. And fortunately, we had a lot of crew deadheading and jump seated on board, so they were helpful. It, it was a non-event in the long run, but it was, it was having to go through the whole gamut of an emergency, declaring it with ATC, going out, um, getting organized with checklists, because you know, fuel. throughout, well, in any career, you know, you're in your training, you're trained for good moments and they also prep you for the bad moments. Always, yes. So, and really and truly with anyone, they would love to say, okay, I've never had to go through a bad moment because you, 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 you get the training, you know what you're supposed to do, but you still wouldn't want to be in that position. No. But then in aviation, no, you are trained to... Here's, what's, here's, what you, here's what should happen, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the best scenario. Yeah. But we're not going to lie to you and say, okay, there's no worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. They prep you for everything. Correct. So what was it like when you realized that, oh, this is a worst case scenario? Oh, no, what am I going to do? What's go what am I going to do at this point? Well, you revert to what you're trained to do. So at the time we were trained, when you see, you, you, call, you call what you're seeing, you know, you know, you have the ICAS warning or the ECAM or whatever airplane you're on, you call it and you have a, your first officer, you may be with a second officer, depending on the type of airplane, but nowadays it's a two-person crew. So you call it, you're trained to call it, identify it correctly, you know, you always have someone flying the aircraft, another person monitoring, so it depends on the roles you're assuming. You know, the person monitoring gets a checklist or whatever the ECAM actions or whatever re is required on the airplane to go through systematically and I'd identify and deal with the issue. And then you as a captain with your crew decide, okay, do I need to ask ATC for a hold? Do I need to declare an emergency? Is it at a May Day or a pan situation? Um, am I going to hold? Is there an altitude uh, consideration? How much fuel? How much time? And of course, your passengers, so you're going to call, if you're on a passenger plane, you're going to call up the person, brief them in the standard requirements and uh, tell them this is what it is. And when they're ready, if it's something that has time, if you have time, they will get back to you. Yes, the cabin is prepared. We had the time, cabin was prepared. We need to be towed off the runway. That's another thing with ATC. You come in and you do what you're trained to do because you get this in sim maybe every six months or every year. So the requirements, regulatory requirements and company standards, you will get this, an engine fire, engine failure, uh, hydraulic issues, pneumatic problems. On the SEM4, the worst was having two engines out on one side. So you're trained for that, but you don't wish that. <laughs> <laughs> like that can stay in the training. Let's, let's yes. just hope that that really doesn't happen in real life. So th those are some of the weirdest things. I'm sure there are other weird things. That I can't remember them all, but they're a little oddball. You know, sometimes you sit back and you laugh at them afterwards. All right. You know. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, you were an air hostess. And I remember, well, I, I can't remember because I was a baby at the time, but I remember hearing stories of, you know, the runway shows that they used to do and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, what was it like as an air hostess? What, what, what was uh, those three years that you were there? What was it like for you? Okay, so when I joined, I didn't know I'd be a pilot. So I <laughs> thought of it as fun, but it was a little bit weird, you know. Silver tray, you're trained with the rum bamboozle. It was weeks of training here in Kingston. You know, the silver trays, you had the little bamboozle 
uh, plastic glasses and you had rum punch and that was a trademark of Air Jamaica back in the day, the rum bamboos. And if you look back at the old ads, so you had to be doing it, yes, on the ground, usually before you left the gate. But as you're taxing out, if you hadn't finished, you had to be serving them and you're bouncing around with those. And the fashion shows were in flight. And if you had a short flight, like from Jamaica to Miami, like on a DC-9, you were scrambling between the little galley and the little lav to, to change. And there were, there were local designers creating these, these fashions. So this so was this a plus. Was, this was a serious, serious fashion show where you're changing outfits. Yes, and, and you're going down the aisle. And this is what Air Jamaica 1968 sold. That, that was their, their ad and their gimmicks, amongst other things, I'm sure. Because I remember, well, for a fashion show to take place, you know, you always see in the movies where you have a nice big room and you have to fix your face and you know do your hair and then you go somewhere else and you know they, they fix your outfit and I'm and I'm in, when I look back in the back of an aircraft and I'm seeing the space around, I'm just like, you know, you have space to stand up, maybe turn around, but no. fashion show? <laughs> no, no. But on the DC nine, it was the worst. And um, I remember you had to go into the the office at Norman Manley there and pick up. Uh, an outfit to so everybody if you had five or six flight attendants we had a few outfits you could you could show and you ha all had to wear makeup and it was pretty strict back in the day and then eventually it was phased out all so right so that is <laughs> the first half or part yes. one of our little conversation thank you for tuning in and Please join us for our next session. This was Squawking.